Good afternoon. Um, imagine a day in 2030. Um, imagine that you're a business person living in a major city like Dallas, Fort Worth, and you have a one-day meeting that you want to attend a place like in um, Atlanta. Say you want to just fly in and fly out the same day. Um, let's, you, uh, you, you pick up a phone or use an app to call for transportation, and probably by the time you have two options. One is a self-driving car will pick you up at home around 7 o'clock in the morning and drop you at the airport by, let's say, 8, 8 or 8.15. That's one option. The second option is um, if an air taxi it will pick you up. Probably you may have to move a few feet you know, to a nearest uh, place called a vertiport. A vertiport is some, somewhere between helipad and a full-fledged uh, airport. So you walk down to the vertiport, uh, get into the air taxi. You may be alone or maybe with another person. And it will take you to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport in 15 minutes. And then, yeah, probably the, the actual flight to the Atlanta probably uh, will be a few feet away, and then you just get into the flight. So the, 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 this, this uh, timeline is not really, yeah, I just put a number 2030, but it may not be that far. It's probably closer or maybe a few years later. The point is, air taxis and air ambulances are becoming reality. Um, and if you have a kid like, uh, like me, and you want to drop the kid at school, let's, at, let's say um, at 7, 7 or 7.30, um, instead of picking up the, uh, the vehicle, ground transportation, you may opt for the uh, air taxi. And especially if the price is not too much. It, to give an example, it could be $50 to go on, a, on the ground transportation, but if you pick up the air taxi, it could be $100. So, you know, given that, you know, probably it will save you an hour time, both while going to the airport and while returning from the airport, you, would, you may prefer to the, say, take the second option, so that you can spend some time with your kid while, before going to the, for your business trip, and also while after returning, you may want to say goodnight to, the, to your kid before he goes to bed. So, for this to happen, NASA is actually spearheading, it is leading uh, a project called Advanced Air Mobility. So, this is, the, this is the vision of NASA, to make air taxis and air ambulances a reality sometime near future. Uh, this, pro uh, this project started somewhere around 2018, November. NASA called for a, a big meeting. Sometime, it was in November, actually, if I remember, 2018, November. 400 people attended the meeting. And from UNT, I represented UNT, and I had a chance to attend the meeting. But today, after uh, four or five years, there are 1,000 participants. And what NASA created is uh, advanced air mobility ecosystem, where all these companies, startup companies, big companies, they're providing different kind of products, services, sensors, software, and hardware. More importantly, platforms platforms such as uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, platforms. And uh, all these companies formed into what you call four groups. And one group is called platforms, like, like, like as I said, uh, vertical takeoff and landing platforms. Companies like Joby, Bell, and uh, Whisk, these are the companies that are working towards. Of course, there are m many more startup companies as well. Then um, the second group is called infrastructure. Infrastructure includes vertiports, um, there, there are something like rooftops where uh, probably uh, several vertiports in a covering the city uh, at, at about 20 miles apart, so that you can go to the nearest vertiport and go to the go to the go to wherever you want to go. It could be simple, it could be an entertainment or maybe a dinner event that you may want to hop onto air taxi and go. On more uh, on a serious uh, applications, if there is an emergency that you need you need to go to the hospital, what I what I heard is that in a city like Dallas Fort Worth, it takes about 15 minutes for you to go to a, to to go to a hospital. In a rural area, it could take 45 minutes. So see the difference an air, air ambulance can make. It can take you in five minutes to probably 15 minutes wherever you are to the nearest hospital. Uh, so that is the vision we have in probably near time, near future. Um, the, one of the uh, key elements here is, in addition to technologies and you know, all those science engineering aspects, it is very important for us to uh, get acceptance from the community. 
Uh, for an example is, if the drones are making a lot of noise, we need to figure out how much noise is tolerable for a community. And we need to also sort of bring awareness in the community to make sure that, oh, these uh, drones are not uh, are there for spying on us. It is for helping us to reduce the congestion, um, reduce the pollution, and more importantly, adding a new dimension to our lifestyle, a new mobility, that you can go quickly wherever you want to go. Plus, if you, want to, if you are missing an item that you want to, in a project, that you are working at home or maybe in a college, then that item can reach you in, in, in very quickly. So these, uh, this new mobility is adding, is complementing to existing transportation. It's adding to ground transportation, trains, and also uh, existing manned aviation. So one of, one of the key elements is what we call air corridors. Now, this is particularly of interest to me. So in future, you're going to see air tracks and uh, air, what you call sky lanes. There may be uh, several lanes, maybe several layers. So that is what we call air corridors. So uh, some of the challenges in air corridors include how do you, how do you find a right of way? Or how do you detect something that is in the, in the, in the lane? And how do you go about it or go around it? Um, so we need a bunch of sensors like uh, range sensors, cameras, um, uh, and more importantly, we need to be able to identify those hazards and then also communicate with the, the other uh, planes that are following us, or you may have to communicate with the ground. And if the, if the problem is so serious, we may have to open up a new lane. So these are called emergency lanes, you have standard lanes, fast lanes, you know, probably uh, emergency lanes if required. Uh, note that these are all not, uh, not, uh, not set in stone. They are not defined yet. So this is just a, a, a plan. You know, there, could be, so there could be one layer or multiple layers, several lengths. Um, there could be also intersections. An intersection could be just like on the way you see on the ground, an intersection between the two lanes, you know, going uh, southbound to you know, maybe westbound. And it could be a circular intersection as well. So imagine all this, you know, imagine all this that are happening, um, uh, and, and then the airspace management becomes a, a, a big challenge. So we're all working towards this. Here is an example of what you call detect and avoid, where let's say your a vehicle is going forward, and suddenly you see a thick cloud. So you have to make some options. You have to decide, should, can we go through it, or should I go around? And most importantly, using, the, using what you call vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, we want to communicate with others, with other vehicles on, on the ground. Um, one important thing is, if you compare with uh, ground transportation, there are no signal lights. So that is a, that's a kind of a challenge for us. So what you can do is, we need to find a substitution, and a good substitution is the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. And for now, the community is working very hard to figure out how to develop these standards. It is a combination of telecom uh, groups as well as um, aviation group working together to figure out standards for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. So another challenge is um, in, in urban areas, you can have this what you call structured airspaces. But in rural areas, uh, you may not have that kind of like, that kind of facilities or that kind of structures, so you may, the vehicles may be going any point to any point. So if that happens, we have to figure out maybe project the trajectory and figure out where could be a potential collision, and then we have to again using vehicle to vehicle communications, we should be able to avoid such collisions. So these are the typical challenges. A small scenario we are showing, a, simulating a small scenario where. Imagine that there is an air cargo in one direction, and there is an air ambulance in another direction. So one thing that we need to look at is, how do you get the right of way? Given that the air ambulance is high priority, so the air ambulance is going to ask, request the other vehicle saying, give me the priority. You know, so th there is a protocol. We need to figure out how to, how to develop this protocol and what information we have to share. But ultimately, the simulation here shows how to find the right of way, how to negotiate for right of way. So these are some challenges, and we'll talk about some bigger challenges. Uh, one of them is autonomy. Autonomy is, we need to, we're looking at you know, increasing levels of autonomy. Basically, we're trying to figure out, remove the pilot from, this, from, the, from, the, from the aircraft, which means that slowly we have to bring the technologies, uh, the science and technology engineering ideas to 
completely remove the pilot from the from the aircraft. Um, and then, how do we need to figure out how to communicate with the machine, machine to machine for vehicle to vehicle communications? We need machine to machine communications. And then there is somehow the there is always a human in the loop. Um, so in case of emergencies, your human has to jump in. So humans and machines have to work together, like a team together seamlessly. So that's called human autonomy teaming. So that's a, that's a big challenge. And traffic management, if there are one or two flights, not a, it's not a big deal. But when you look at thousands of vehicles flying in our airspace, we have to come up with a solid way of, a, a way to manage this whole traffic. And then no matter uh, whatever uh, reservations you make for these air corridors, there is always uh, mixed traffic. There will be helicopters. There will be um, uh, manned traffic, and, uh, and and we have to coexist. So, which means that somehow all these vehicles have to coexist, and we have to integrate um, these mixed vehicles in the airspace. Then, communication. Communication can be provided through satellites. Communication could be provided through cellular network, or our own uh, radios that are placed in the in the in the on, on the aircraft. So, all this communication is to make sure that. Uh, the vehicles can communicate with people. Vehicle can uh, need to communicate with the with the other vehicles. This has to be seamless, meaning that there cannot be an interruption. If the messages are lost, probably uh, you know right, negotiations like right of way, you know, they may be affected. Um, conflict management. As of now, interestingly, most of the time you have to talk. The pilot has to talk to the ground control. But in future, there may be scenarios where the vehicles are so close, there is no time for the for the air, the vehicle to communicate with the ground. So that means the vehicles have to interact with each other in real time, instantly, for negotiating the you know whatever uh, for a, uh, uh, right of way. Then uh, security and privacy become more important uh, because we wa we don't want um, uh, what what you call personal information to leak out, uh, and 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 uh, especially when a when a when a vehicle is reacting to a message, we have to make sure that it is coming from the authenticated source. So authentication has to be take, uh, has to be addressed as well. Then, um, as you know, regulations are still evolving, like uh, uh, like what spectrum to use and what what kind of frequency bands we have to use and how high we have to fly, and then what kind of minimum operating condition that we need to satisfy to fly in these uh, corridors. These are evolving, you know, but. Uh, the, both the industry, industry is jumping forward, you know, leaping forward, and aviation authorities like FAA are catching up with them to 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 make sure the regulations are in place. And uh, uh, I I lead several standards, and one of them is the vehicle to vehicle standards. And um, you know, from UNT, I, I, I we are chairing, we are leading several standards as well. And today, actually, I want to share with you the most exciting that we are, UNT is leading, UNT is working on. Uh, we are flying the very first uh, flight in the air corridor, starting from uh, Fort Worth to UNT Discovery Park. So this is our, um, thank you. And if we are successful with this phase one, we want to go from Discovery Park to Frisco. And if we are successful with the phase two, then we want to go from Dallas to uh, Oklahoma, Choctaw Nation, to, big, to have a longer corridor, about 186 miles. So this is the future. And you know, one day you will see uh, what I call air taxis and air ambulances will come closer to you very soon in the future. Thank you.